Man, you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life, and we're back. The art of checking in. Y'all have heard me talk about guys checking in in the past. What is checking in? Checking in is what you do when you fear for your life. When you done ran your mouth trying to act tough to the wrong guys. And now they ain't trying to do a whole lot of talking. They're going to stomp you. They're going to do something bad to you. Now you got to get up out of there. You can't just go over to the hole, to solitary confinement, knock on the door and say, hey, I done ran into some problems. Can y'all please let me in? Doesn't work that way. Maybe you got out there on that poker table and y'all playing till, till Friday when commissary comes around and they've kept a tally on how much money you owe and you know you can't pay it. You was what we call selling wolf tickets. You was ass betting. You ain't have no money. Now you done lost. You ain't got no money on your books. So you can't go to commissary and pay these boys that money you owe them. Come Friday, you better not come with any type of excuse. It doesn't matter if you did have the money and the commissary people messed up on your papers. And now you don't get no commissary. If you return and you cannot pay these men, the first thing they're going to think, no matter what it is, is you ran game on me. You sat down at that poker table trying to take my money and you didn't ever have no money. So you was going to expect me to pay you, but you can't pay me. Most times some guys, they check in. Checking in is when you have put yourself in a situation or someone else is applying pressure to you and you got to find a way to get up out of there. Get over to the hole where you feel safe. Ain't no telling how long you're going to be in the hole. Ain't no telling what you're going to have to do to get in the hole. But these guys check in. I can proudly say in all my time, all the years, throughout my life of doing time, I've never checked in. I've had some scary, scary situations that I didn't know what the outcome was going to be. But I faced them like a man. I took my lumps, my bruises, fell down and I got right back up. It's part of being a man. It's part of doing time. Everybody's not going to do that. Guys will tell on you to try to eliminate their problem. And if that don't work, they got to me, me, get up out of there. They're going to go to the hole. So today I'm going to do some of these check-in stories for you. The art of checking in. I've talked about this in the past. That guard will walk by that cell. I've seen hundreds of guys wait till count time. And that guard walk by, psst, hey, I fear for my life, man. But it says in the DOC handbook, y'all have to get me out of here if I'm in fear. Or drop a note on themselves to get themselves gone. Slide a note on the administration's door saying that they're scared. It's a whole lot of different ways, guys. Check in. Y'all gonna love these check-in stories. They're uh, entertaining, to say the least. You know how to seen it. You know how to lived it. So, let's relive it. Store day, the day we all get our commissary, the day that everybody looks forward to. It's one of the days guaranteed somebody's going to check in. You never really know who it is. And sometimes it actually amazes you like, damn, he checked in and I just knew he was going to go hard. I never expected him to check in. Some Sometimes guys will check in because they owe people and they're scared. They owe people and they have commissary, but they don't have enough to pay everybody. Then sometimes guys will check in just because they don't want to pay. It's like, man, I owe out $150. I don't want to pay. But if I buck, if I tell them, man, I ain't paying that, I'm going to have to fight. Boys up here ain't fighting, so I'm going to have to stab. I ain't about stabbing. So I'm going to get stabbed. Yeah, it's time to check in. I cannot tell you, like clockwork, I don't think there was a single commissary in all the time I was in prison that I didn't see somebody check in. You'd see the guys. The way commissary works is you get a slip. And this slip will be everything that you can order from commissary is on this slip. From ramen noodles to 
all your zoom zooms and wham whams, all your favorite little tasty teeth rotten treats, Snickers bars, candy bars, M and M's, you you know nutty bars, honey buns, cinnamon rolls, sodas, big bags of chips, cheese, hygiene stamps. This paper has everything on it you could imagine. You got false teeth, they got the stuff on there to. It's that stuff, that stuff that you put on the false teeth, stick in your mouth. Even that's on the list. You fill this slip out, and it's a bubble system. Like sodas might be six one nine two might be the code for you know Dr Pepper. So you bubble in six one nine two, and then beside it there's an amount. You want twenty four sodas, you bubble in a two, you bubble in a four, you just ordered your food. You then they have a box hanging on the wall. That box is locked. You then walk up there. The slip has your name, your inmate number, your housing unit, all that on it. And you drop that slip in. You know when they come to pick the slips up. If y'all go to commissary Friday, they're usually going to come Wednesday and pick that slip up. Then they're going to take them over to the commissary window. They run it through a machine. If you have money on your inmate account, boom, it goes through. It's almost like a credit card. If you don't, denied. Then that Friday, they're going to call commissary. And the way that works is, you know when your building's going to commissary Friday and they'll call your pod. Such, such building, such, such pod, stand by for commissary, stand by for commissary. Oh, man. Everybody's scrambling. Sometimes, first thing in the morning, you'll see guys come out and it's an orange net bag, like a clear net bag, like one of those old fishnet wife beaters, except this is nylon and it's a bag like a pillowcase. With a string on the top that you can see through. Guys will usually come out first thing in the morning. They got their bag in their back pocket. I've seen guys come out at 8 o'clock in the morning. And stand there all day long. So that they can be in the first group of guys that go over. They're not releasing 80 some inmates at once to go to commissary. They're going to release 10 or 15 at a time. So it doesn't overwhelm them. The hallway's not that big. You go over there. As you come through the door. You take your inmate ID. Unclip it. Hand it to the officer, and he's got a stack of inmate IDs. He then takes these inmate IDs over to the little window. You know how, like, the hood gas station's got the little window with the bars on it, and you can't go inside the store, but you can see all the stuff back there? That's how the prison commissary works. The guard takes and gives them the IDs. She picks up the first ID, looks at the name, goes through the commissary slips, pulls your order, calls your name. You come up there. Open your bag, they put the stuff on the counter, you take it, thank you. You put it inside the bag, put it inside the bag. You then take that bag, return back to your building, you can eat. With Greensville, we would go every two weeks. So when you go, you better get everything you need because you're not going back for 14 days. Then every, every so often they would skip it and it would be three weeks. And then you've got the riffraff that comes with everything that goes on in prison. So if you go on lockdown, you haven't been to commissary in three weeks. Somebody gets stabbed. The whole thing's locked down for two weeks. Time y'all get back to commissary. It has now been five weeks before, you know, since you've been to commissary. So you better make sure, like I said, you get what you want. Guys will get that bag, head back to the building, knowing damn well they're not about to pay anybody. Knowing they don't have enough to pay everybody they owe. So they're going to have to tell one of these guys, maybe two of these guys, man, I ain't got it, man. He just watched you go over there and pay that man. Then he watched you go pay that man. So out of all the guys you owe, you got to figure out which one is one going to, he's going to want to hear my story and will not mess me up. Which one is soft? So the guy you go to to say, hey, man, I ain't got it this week. I'll get you next time. Just stood there and watched you pay everybody else. And I'm the one you choose to say you're not going to pay? Oh, no, nah, you got to catch these hands. It's fight, you know, it's go time. Let's get it. Guys will come back with the commissary bags and instead of returning to their housing unit and into their pod, they would go straight up the staircase to the sergeant's office. Walk in the sergeant's office and say, I fear for my life, man. Sergeant look at him with that bag. Now nah, you owe people money. You need to carry your ass back downstairs. I'm telling you, I fear for my life. So if anything happens to me, I'm going to let them know I came to you when I told you the guys were going to hurt me. 
and that you didn't do anything about it, the blood's going to be on your hands and you're going to get fired. So what do you want us to do? I'm checking in. Take me to the hole. You're going to, you know, you could be in the hole a couple months, right? Like it's hot back there. I know, but I'd rather be in the hole than be in the hospital. Come on, let's go. Put the handcuffs on me. They put the handcuffs on them. We come back from commissary, walk right by that little office, by that sergeant's office where either the sergeant, lieutenant, or an officer's in there sitting. In every single commissary you would see an inmate sitting there in handcuffs with his whole bag of commissary beside him going to the hole voluntarily. Sometimes they'd have a guy in this office, maybe two guys in this office, and a guy in that office, two, three guys check in. Very, very common. Like I told you, checking in is the art of running from your problems. Can't nobody get you in the hole. When you're in solitary confinement, you're in that cell by yourself. The inmates that you owe money, they're out on the other side of the yard. They can't get back to the hole and get to you. But here's the catch. You're going to eventually come out the hole if you don't get shipped. You don't get to determine where you're going to go when you come out the hole. So you think you're slick by running off on these boys and not paying them. There's a very good chance they're going to take you and put you right back where you came from. So now you've put these guys in a position where they didn't get paid. They know you're scared. You ran to the hole, possibly told on somebody. And now here you come walking back in with that bag of commissary you didn't want to pay nobody with. All your personal belongings in another bag. Looking at the same men that you ran from. Oh my God, this is a bad, bad day. These dudes saw me check in and now they put me right back in here with them. This is not like the streets. Keep that in mind. You know how out here in the real world, if say you owe a car company or a small car lot for your car and you're delinquent on your payments, they just come take the car. Don't nobody show up, knock on your door, drag you out front, start stabbing you, punch you on the face. They just take your car. If you don't pay your electric, they cut your power off. Then also in the real world, you can have beef with somebody, get on that phone, man, 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 or jump on the internet and get and do all that behind a keyboard and there's no repercussions to it you're never gonna see that man even if you know the dude you're beefing with on the phone you know where his hat you know his habits you know where he hangs out who he's around the neighborhoods he frequents you're gonna avoid him that is not an option in prison when you owe somebody in prison they're coming for it he might live cell you know 108 you might be in cell 102. He's going to walk six cells down, step in your cell, and now it's just you and him. And it's six by ten, eight by ten cell, and he's standing there going, hey, let me get that. What are you going to do in that moment? If you can't beat him, you're going to kick it over. Ain't nowhere to run and hide. The only place you can go is to the hole. And like I said, even then, it's not guaranteed to save because you might come out and have to deal with those same guys. Many years ago, I got, I guess it was towards the end of my stay at Greensville prior to being shipped. They moved me from 100 pod to 200 pod. I told you they put the dude in the cell with me that was from Petersburg, said he got all cut up and that he ate part of his victim to try to get the insanity plea. It's the same guy I told you when he climbed off the top bunk because of where they cut him. His guts were messed up. He would climb down. He couldn't control his bowel movements. He would just, when stepping off the top bunk on the counter, he would just poop. So him and the boy, he likes the boys, end up getting me moved up out this cell I've been in forever. They take me next door and put me in 200 pod. I know pretty much everybody in this building. I've been on this compound longer than a lot of men. I know I've been in that building. I'm in the top 10 of guys out of 386, 172. Out of 344 men, I'm definitely in the top 10 men that have been in this building the longest amount of time with the maintenance job they want to keep me in this building they take me and they move me next door into 200 pod that's when i told you i would end up with the cellmate bama that had killed his first kid got out and damn near killed a second kid i meet a guy while i'm in there and like i said i knew everybody in this building i knew most of the people on this side of the yard well, we always get new guys. When somebody checks in, that leaves a bed open. 
Now, somebody's coming out the hole. They got to put them somewhere. They're going to put them in that bed where that man that used to live checked in. He's been going to his bed. Or somebody comes from another prison and just shows up here. There's open beds. They bring a guy in by the name of Troy. I had not seen Troy probably 15 years. And when I did see him prior to going to prison, wasn't really my type of dude. He was a whole entire junkie. Junk, what's a junkie? A junkie. Had that dope fiend larceny with him on the streets. Was known to, to smoketh the rock. Shooteth the dope. He was a fiend. I wasn't known for hanging out with no dudes that was on that type of time. The dudes I hung out with, some of them popped his hands, dudes drank, smoked bud and stuff. But for the most part, my circle of guys, they were just about getting money. We all had that in common. We liked cars, females, jewelry. That was my group of guys. But then you would have guys that used to be like us that went on to get high that we no longer let play in our reindeer games. So I hadn't seen Troy in a very long time. I cut him off back in the day when he started getting high. Troy would go on to rob what's called the Moose Lodge. A lot of states got the Moose Lodge. He robbed a Moose Lodge out where we lived at, along with a couple other stores, and got a lot of time. I think Troy had upwards of almost 50 years. And it got locked up around 1998, 1999, right? And by this time, it is around 2000. 10, 2011, when I run into him again for the first time since way back in the day when he became a junkie. I didn't recognize him. Prison will put weight on you. They feed you potatoes three times a day. You're going to eat cabbage, and every type of potato you can think about. You're going to eat sweet potatoes, mashed potatoes, old, dirty, dusty potatoes, potatoes with rocks in them, fried potatoes for the starch. Potatoes are cheap cost effective and they will put weight on you troy notices me i don't notice him when he comes in with his bags i don't know where he came from if he came from the hole if he had just transferred here i don't know none of the backdrop on that i just know i watched him come in with a couple other new guys deer in headlight look scary looking walk right by us and I can't say that I remembered anything about him. I had been locked up so long at this point, I had started forgetting people just to meet new people. He goes on in his cell, puts all his stuff away, comes out. He knows some of these guys, you know, throughout this pod from being at other institutions with him and from doing time. The man's been down a little bit now, right? He's talking to them and he makes his way over towards where we're at. Knows one of the guys that's in my little circle of dudes I know. And it's talking to him and he keeps glimpsing over at me. And I'm not talking to him. I'm just going about my conversation with the dude I'm talking to. And this dude keeps glimpsing at me. So he, you know, initiates contact. Hey, man, I know you. Or where, where you know me from? I'm thinking maybe knows me from prison. One of the many jails I've been in. Is this good? Is this bad? Like, I'm not getting a bad vibe. I don't have them. My spider senses ain't tingling. I ain't got that. Them butterflies in my stomach. It don't feel like nothing bad. Where you know me from? From Richmond? Yeah, I'm from Richmond. From Ampill? Yeah, I'm from Ampill. You're Jay. Yeah, I'm Jay. Who are you? I'm Troy, man. Troy, Troy, Troy. Not registering. I used to run with such and them. And da 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 da. And I had the case where I robbed the Moose Lodge and they found the cash register at my house. We busted open and he breaks it down. I'm like, yeah, I remember you. You're the junkie. You're the guy that smoked up all the rock in Richmond. I didn't say that, but that's, you know, you're associated with what people know you for doing. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, I remember you, man. How you been? He's like, been in prison, man. Got almost 50 years to do. I've been in here since, you know, back in the 90s. All right, cool. That's what it is. This dude kept trying to be my buddy, trying to be my friend. He would come out of his cell, come right over to where he was at day in and day out and sit down and conversate and try to kick it and chop it up and get in the mix. And just based off of what I remember him being, I really didn't have a whole lot of kick it for dude. Because the fact of the matter is, is if you were a junkie on the streets, oh, a prison is a whole nother world. You could be the biggest junkie of all time in prison because, I mean, drugs are everywhere. Any and everything you think about that's on the streets 
It's in the prison system. And you ain't got to get in your car and go to the projects or meet somebody at a corner store or pull up on a corner to go get it. It's as simple as maybe walking two cells over from your cell and being like, come on, you know I'm good for it. Put your hand out. They drop it in. You go back to your cell and get high. So with knowing his history, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. Run into him again in prison, especially this prison, which is just off the chain and flooded with drugs. Anything goes. First thing I think is he's absolutely getting high. There's no way he's here at Greensville and he's not getting high. I see dudes shoot dope daily. I smell the crack smoke in the air when you walk by people sell and they're in there smoking crack. A lot of guys were getting high up there, right? Over time, he tries to talk to me more and more. And I'm the tattoo man at the time. Hey, how's such and such doing? Oh, uh, they all right. I'll give him some backdrop. Yeah, this person died. This person got killed. This person's locked up. We know all the same people, right? I need some tattoo work, Jay. I see him go to commissary. He's a fat boy. He's always eating. I mean, it's several times a day you'll see this man walk by. He might have a soda in his hand and a big-ass honey bun. Headed to the microwave. Going to heat this honey bun up. Throw some peanut butter on it. He's going to sit there with a spoon and eat this honey bun. He's always got a commissary. What you looking to do? Well, I want to get this and this and this. Now, all right, slow down, slow down. One thing at a time. What are you looking to do? All right. I want to start by, I got this half sleeve and, you know, tie into it and turn it into a whole sleeve, cut off of my wrist. I don't want nothing showing on my hands, sleeve my arms out. I want to do my legs, da, da, da. He gets into telling me all his ideas. So I'm looking at his, his tattoos on his arms. This shit looks terrible. It looks like a third grader did it with a marker and it will not erase off. You're stuck with it for life, dummy. So I tell him, well, let me start with your legs, man. How, how much of your leg you want to do? Because I ain't going but so high. I'm not getting all up next to your sack and all that and tattoo and all that. That's a, Go to somebody else for that. No, I just want to do for my knees down and then cut it off like where an ankle sock would go. All right, cool. What you looking to do? Man, I want to do this koi fish scene and the waves and, you know, these this, this, and this. And I want to... I said, all right. I give him the price on it. Now, usually what I would do is even before I would start drawing your stuff, you got to put a deposit down. I can't tell you how many patterns I drew up. And then I go to give it to somebody and they, yeah, my money's messed up right now. Hold the pad and know I'm going to get it from you. And then they end up not coming back. So now I've invested time in drawing a sketch, shaded it up so you can see what the finished product's going to look like. And now you're not getting the tattoo. I didn't make him give me a deposit because I'd seen this man go to commissary time and time again. So I'm thinking he's good money. When we go start on the tattoo, Jay, he starts bugging me about it, bugging me about it. And at this point, I am a slave to the tattoo machine. I'm running this tattoo gun. Anytime I'm not at work, that gun is running. I got somebody sitting out there watching, and it's me, 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 me. I'm running the gun. I tell him, look, man, dude got locked up behind some dumb shit. I got an opening. If you want to slide in, I can start all the outlining of your entire calf and get the front, back, sides, all that outlined in one sitting and probably some of the shading done. And then I can schedule you after heels to come back in, tighten up some of the lines, thick up some of the other lines. Once I get them thick, then I can go through and start doing your dark shading, your light shading, you know, so on and so on. I bet. What do you want to do with that? We're going to do it in my cell. I'm not going to be in your cell, get caught in there and get jammed up. Like, come over to my cell. All right, all right. This koi fish is massive. And I'd started doing a lot of these things. At one point, guys were big into the koi fish. So I draw up like this Japanese koi fish, the waves coming in front of it, and then some splashing behind it. Get it sketched up. A lot of the other stuff is just freehand work I'm going to do to fill in. He comes, lays up on the bunk, stretches his leg out. I place the patterns. We have this clear deodorant. I run it over his leg after I shave it, you know, the calf and stuff. I take the stencil. I put it on. Smooth it out, pull it, transfer the pattern from the paper to his skin, start outlining. Oh, 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 why does this hurt so bad? Because it's your legs. Man, I wouldn't think the calves would hurt like that. Oh, yeah, the calves hurt. It's a, it's a touchy spot. He takes it like a champ. I line everything. Get in the shade in the koi fish, knock the koi fish out. 
So now when he comes in, I got to do the waves. He wants to do some like samurai stuff on the lower parts of his ankle. And he's got his other ideas for this other stuff. All right, cool. This is the beginning of the week when this happens. I give him a list. This is what I'm charging you. You're not just going to pay me with whatever you want to pay me with. Go to commissary and order me these things. Man, I got you, Jay. I got you. Now, in the meantime, I would see him out there at the poker table gambling. And sometimes, if your credit was good, they would let it run till store day. Ain't no money in here right now, but they're not going to shut the poker game down. They're just going to write down what you owe. And before you go to commissary, if you owe them, hey, look, you owe me this amount of money. You owe me $40. Here's a slip for $39.91. So he plays poker. Store day rolls around. We're standing there talking. Me, him, there's other guys in groups talking. They call the first 15 for commissary. We slide out the door in the first 15. We are in line. They are taking our IDs. And they're filling people's commissary orders. They call his name. Troy such and such. He goes up to the window. Oh, he's got the big bag. He's maxed all the way out. Got everything and anything you can imagine. I don't think nothing about it. I'm standing right with him. How can he not pay me, right? They call three or four other guys' names. They get their commissary. And then finally, they call me. I used to hate when I get over there first. Give them my ID. And they put my ID on the very bottom and stack all the other IDs on top. And then they start pulling from the top. Why the hell you take my ID? I'm first over here and I got to go last. So I'm one of the last guys to get the commissary out that group. I head on back over to the building. Go up in the cell. Put all my stuff away, organize my stuff, move some things around, fold the commissary bag up, lift my mat up, put it under it, lay my commissary, you know, my mat back down on top of the commissary bag. I've got all my stuff. Now, with me being the tattoo guy and the guy that makes things happen in there, little store box running, it's time to collect. This is the danger of having people owe you or running a store box is if they don't pay, everybody's watching. Everybody knows the man owes you. And if you don't pay, that he doesn't pay you. They expect him not paying you to have some type of consequences to it. I usually didn't have a lot of problems with not getting paid, right? I knew if I even dealt with you and I thought there was any chance I was going to have to do something to you behind some commissary, why would I even deal with you? I'm not going to. So I basically dealt with guys that I knew, all right, this dude's good. I ain't got to worry about nothing. I wait till everybody goes to commissary. I'm not going to go push up on nobody. I'm not chasing you down for my money. I didn't have to chase you down and give it to you. So guys, you know, they call the next 15, the next 15, the next 15, until our pod is last call for commissary, last call for commissary. You missed this call, you're out back till next time we go. The last little few scragglers make their way over there and get to commissary. So throughout the next hour or so, I've got guys, and if one guy's paying me, the other guys aren't going to come over there until he's... He's done paying me. That's being nosy. You wait your turn. Guys are swinging by, breaking me off, but they owe me. No problem, no problem. I'm looking at the list. I keep a list written down and hidden of guys that owe me, and I mark off the stuff they owe me as they come. All right, he paid me. I can mark his name off the list. He paid me. I can mark his name off the list. I'm looking at the list. I still got Troy on the list. I look out my cell over at Troy's cell. I don't see Troy. Maybe he's up in his cell. Maybe he's, you know, waiting for these guys to finish. He's laying in his bunk. A little bit more time goes by. And I'm like, yo, where the hell is Troy at, man? Where's he? I come out my cell. I go, hey, I got sneakers on. Take my sneakers off. Put my boots on. Even though he's my homeboy, I might have to wreck with him. Not my homeboy. It's somebody I know. He doesn't fall in the homeboy category. You don't get that title, homeboy. I take my sneakers off. Put my boots on, my state boots. And guys know a lot of times when they see somebody come out in their state boots, it's wreck time. I head over towards the cell, and I'm about halfway across the pod when I see the front gate slide open. Slang. Two officers come in pushing a brown cart. Already know. Looking around, everybody else that I know in here that usually owes people, they're all accounted for. Still looking over Troy's cell, but they're coming in with this cart, and they're beelining straight towards Troy's cell, two officers off. Pushing this big brown cart, plastic cart thing with wheels on it, right? Like a big laundry cart. They stop at his cell. No. No, 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 no. I walk by like I'm going to the microwave and I look over in the cell. He's not up in the cell. 
the Sellies over there, making sure they don't take none of his stuff, telling them, yeah, that's his, that's his, that's all that stuff in that locker right there, that belongs to Troy. All that stuff over there is mine. Stuff on the bottom counter, that's mine. The stuff on the top shelf, that's his. They pack all Troy's stuff up, right? Guys are coming in and going out at this point. Wreck is finishing up. So I slide out the gate. Officer done left with all his belongings. I know he's not coming back. Did something happen? Did he get to fight when he came back from commissary? What is, I ain't heard nothing. Don't nothing look out of the way. Ain't nobody gossiping or whispering. Where the hell is Troy at? So I, everybody's coming from commissary. I mean, they're coming in from the wreck. I slide out the gate. I tell the officer, hey, pop the other gate. I got to grab something. They pop the other gate. I had a pretty good report. I could get out. It's the maintenance man on top of the, just being, you know, staying out of the way. They let me out. I go up to the third floor where the sergeant is. I'm hoping this ain't where this dude is, but I know in my heart this is where he's at. I walk up there, and there he sits, handcuffed, sitting in the sergeant's office, looking around, shameful as hell, because everybody that's got to walk by that sergeant's office is looking at him like, yo, look at this dude checking in. Now, you got two different pods up there, so you got 172 men that are going to walk by you at some point in this time of you checking in and be like, Man, soft ass. Look at you in there. You just checked in on somebody's scary ass, man. With your big ass bag of commissary. Somebody gonna beat your ass. They gonna beat your ass. I go up there and I look through the, you know, it's big glass windows all the way around the sergeant's office. And he looks up and he looks at me and he puts his head down. I can't say nothing. What am I gonna do? Uh, now the sergeant knows I'm part of the reason he's checking in. So I just come out, hey, lock him up. Put him on investigation. Why this man scared? He's part of it. I just seen him threatening him or he's making gestures. So I just stand there looking, waiting for him to look up at me, right? Got his head down. Please look up at me. Make eye contact with me. I want you to know that I know you checked in. I'm looking at you. There's other guys going in three and 400 pie, which is on the third floor. And I'm just standing there with them like I'm about to go in. And I'm steadily looking. I'm steadily looking. I'm steadily looking. That would be it. Nothing I can do. I can't get in there to get at him. I can't make no threats. All I can do is mean mug him. Hope that he looks up at me. Never looked up at me again. I went back downstairs. Went to dude's cellmate. The cellie's a bitch. He checked in. Blah, blah, blah. Man, I ain't never see that coming. Did he tell you he was going to check in? Did you know he was going to check in? Because if you know that man was going to run off with my money and not pay me, I'm going to press you to pay me. You live in here with him. You allowed him to get over on me. Now it's your debt. Dude, no, I ain't have no idea. He owes me money too. Shows me a piece of paper. He'd been borrowing stuff from me when he ran out of food, playing out at that poker table this week. I mean, he owes me stuff too. That would be the last time I saw Troy's bitch ass. He rolled up out of there with a half done leg sleeve. The koi fish was amazing. All the outline was there. Anybody that tattoos could pick up where I left off and just start shading and adding little things to fill it in. But it just goes to show you, you don't know who you can trust. You think that you loaning stuff out, letting people owe you is a good idea. I'm here to tell you it is not. Because if they can get to them guards where they're protected before you can get to them to collect your money, you better believe they're going to go the guard route and check in on your ass. I can still remember the first time I seen a gang member check in. Which it blew my mind. You guys have the numbers. There are a lot of y'all. Why would this dude check in? What is he afraid of? Is he afraid of his gang? Is his whole, his whole gang afraid of this other group of guys? Is he afraid that he knows they're all going to get violent towards another group and they could possibly get hurt? Is he really not about that life? It kind of blew my mind. The very first time I seen a gang member check in. But that wouldn't be the first or the last time that I've seen a gang member check in. Violence is almost always, almost always the reason someone checks in. Even with Troy and Troy's story, Troy checked in because he knew he owed me. I wasn't going to let it slide. That homeboy shit goes out the window. This is business. I'm going to dig up in your mouth. I don't care if I knew you from the streets. We wasn't cool like that. You took my money. I mean, you knew you owed me. Now you want to pay everybody else. And because you know me from the streets, you think you're not going to pay me. No, I got to set the pace here. I got to show people that don't matter for friends and I, I got to do what I got to do. The boys out at them poker tables, poker is a serious thing in prison. 
My advice to you, if you ever get locked up, is stay away from that poker table. Boys love that poker. But with that poker, is going to come some larceny. You got some guys that ain't got no money. You got guys that'll gamble all night long. And it's like, all right, go to your cell and grab a commissary real quick. All right, I'm going to have to borrow from somebody. I ain't got none. Like I told you. So you're going to try to, you expect me to pay you, but you ain't never have the money you owed me? Oh, catch these hands. We had a GD dude. And I would say the three top gangs in that prison at the time were Bloods being number one. They were the most ruthless, the, the most ruthless aside from the MS 13s. And they had the largest numbers. You put 10 random gang members in a pile, eight of them were blood. Second would be the Crip. All them Crip dudes were, they were mobbed up. And then you had your GDs. Then you had your ABs. You had your other little non affiliates. You got all these just different spinoffs of gangs everywhere. Well, we've got a GD dude that just constantly runs around causing trouble, more or less. They should have violated him on the first one, but due to the fact that I guess he was a smaller dude, they could really hurt him if they put three dudes on him at once. They didn't violate him. Stuff starts coming up missing in the pod. Little things. Guy, first instance I remember was somebody left a radio laying on the table. That's a no-no. That was his fault in his own. But at the same time, just because he left his radio out there, don't give nobody the right to touch nothing. If you're a convict or, you know, somebody that's really been doing time and you come across that, you can make an announcement. Hey, who left the radio out here on the table, man? You need to get your shit. Don't be leaving your stuff out here. Somebody going to get you. Well, we had a situation where a guy a couple cells down from me. Everybody's out and about in the day room and dudes are going out to wreck and doors are still open. We come in from wreck, and he makes an announcement. This is another gang member now, right? GD dude. Hey, who went in my cell and took my tobacco? Or as the, as the old dudes call it, backer. Who took my backer? They used to sell these cans, these round green cans, tobacco called Midnight Special. That was your menthol. And then they sold a round red can that was your full flavor. He comes in. Goes to roll a cigarette and realizes his whole can of tobacco that was sitting on the countertop is missing. He comes out and makes an announcement. Now, this dude is known for putting in work. He'll fight. Everybody knows who he is. Kind of crazy to just, you know, somebody decided to run up in his cell of all cells. But maybe his cell was, you know, one of the few last doors that was still open and available. Otherwise, you got to ask the guard to open the door. Somebody might overhear it. It's quicker just to sneak up in there and sneak out real quick. Yo, who in my cell? Makes an announcement for everybody to hear. Dudes are continuing to do what they're doing. He gets louder and louder till he acquires the room's attention. Who went in my cell? Who went in my cell and took my stuff, man? Which one of you dudes in here was on the table when I left, going to wreck? Somebody went in my cell and took my stuff. Crickets. Silence. Nobody says anything. His GD homeboys come over there and I'll mob up with him underneath the staircase. They're talking, looking around. He's asking all them, all them like, oh, we ain't seen nobody near your cell. And we would exit out the back door of the building to go to wreck. His cell just so happened to be right near the back door where you go out. So lots of people walk by that cell. Nobody knows nothing. It's like Casper the ghost went in there and stole it. Or, you know, a crackhead slithered in like this, stole it and then slithered back out on his belly. Nobody saw nothing. Couple days goes by and this dude is still making a scene about it. He's making announcements all the time and he's got a, you know, his little homeboys and them, they put together the tobacco, broke him off. So he's got his, but it doesn't change the fact that somebody went in his cell and stole it. This is no. This is the equivalent of somebody breaking in your house and stealing something off your kitchen table. Or you have a company over and when they leave, you know, you go in your bedroom and something's missing out of one of your drawers. You do not steal. It is the quickest way to get yourself hurt next to messing with one of them boys in there, right? And the drugs. Two or three days have gone by now and he's constantly, you know, asking people. He walked up to me, Jay, I ain't seen nobody come by my cell. I didn't live with a couple of cells down from me. Thinking back about it. Ah, man. There was a lot of dudes lined up to go out to wreck. It was all going in the yard. I ain't seen nobody, you know, out of the ordinary. I didn't see nobody go in your cell, but I ain't seen nothing crazy with nobody around just selling nothing that shouldn't have been that wasn't in line. All right, man, he just keeps on going about his business. Well, it just so happened there's a white dude in our pod that doesn't really mess with anybody. Country boy, bigger dude. That likes to come out of his cell. He lived on the top tier. And at times, he would just come out and lean on the top tier. 
and just kind of watch what's going on in the pod. Quiet. Didn't bother nobody, like I said. He goes to the GD dude and tells him, I guess in secrecy, which it didn't stay a secret very long. I saw somebody go in your cell the other day. What? Yeah, man. When all y'all exited for wreck before the officers closed the door, I seen somebody go in your cell and he came out with something hiding on, hiding underneath his shirt. Hmm. Who was it? Dude's out for blood. Dude's gonna hurt him. It was your little GD homeboy. Little dude that, you know, was always running around here doing dumb shit that y'all should have been beat up before, like I said. Nah. Yeah, man, but do me a favor. I don't want no smoke, man. I don't want no type of problems. I don't bother nobody. But I don't like no thief. I don't like nobody steals. If you're going to take it, take it by force. Don't go in there like no little bitch and steal it, right? Good looking. He calls a meeting right there in the middle of the pod. Calls all the GDs over there. Hey, we got to have a meeting. They all squad up. What's up? Who did it? They know what's going on. Who did it? White dude on the top cell told in the, in the top tier and a cell over there told me he seen who went myself. Just put the man right on front street. So much for leaving his name out of it. He saw who went in my cell. The little dude has been, you know, causing all the chaos. Who was it? Who was it? Let me know. I'll take off on him. You would think that. And him hearing it got exposed, he'd be damn the son is back. He'd be quiet about it. Play the background. But usually the guilty party is a lot of times the loudest party, right? Who was it? Who was it? It was you. What? Man, I ain't go up in your cell and take nothing. Yes, you did. You went in my cell. Stole my tobacco. Be looking out for your little dirty, grimy ass. You want to steal from me? Bro, I swear to God, I'll go up there and I'll dust that country boy's ass off. Nah, you're not going to go up there and do nothing. Nobody's going to go up there and do nothing. Because you stole it. He ain't got no reason to lie to me. He don't know you like that. He don't even know me like that. He wouldn't get caught up in GD business or come and tell me something that ain't got nothing to do with him unless he saw something. The man did what he's supposed to do. You a thief. You stole from me. We're going to beat the shit out of you. With them standing out in the pod, there's an officer right there in the control booth. If they attack him, they're all going to the hole. If they attack him, any money they're owed for drugs, weapons, phones, store boxing, their means of you know, their finances, it's all gone. You all go to the hole, them debts are dead, there's nobody to pay, everybody's happy, yay, we ain't got to pay these GD dudes no money, right? So he tells them, we're getting ready to lock down at this point for count. We're all going in our cells. They've already called lockdown for count, lockdown for count. So they can't, they don't have the time to jump him and beat him up right there. But dude is already letting him know, like, I'm just waiting on him to slap him, punch him, do something. Like I said, he couldn't. But he's letting him know, look, when we come out of the cells after count, come on down to my cell. We DP in you. Like, they're going to X you all the way out. You ain't GD no more. Like, that is a bad thing. You could go in there and lose your life. Them guys could beat you to death. You stolen from one of them, so now they hate you. They could decide to take you to the knives and start stabbing you and poking you. It's a good chance when you go down there. You're definitely going to leave out of there bleeding. Really, really bad if you leave out of there. There's also a chance that you might leave out on the stretch if any one of them decides to get carried away. Because the big dude wants to see you pay. He wants them to hurt you as bad as possible. He's not going to tell them to stop. They're going to stop when they decide to stop. And as many as them, you know, want to jump on you at once, as many people as they can put in that cell are going to come in there and they're going to just hurt you, right? Dude, man, I'm telling y'all, y'all got it messed up, man. I swear, I'd rather just rumble the big dude, the big country boy, because he's lying, he's lying. He's not lying. If you go up there and say anything... It's going to be that much worse. You need to come down here and get you, you know, get what you got coming to you after we lock down for count, right? My first thought, I've seen it so many times now. I've told you all about these checking guys. When the guards come around to do that count, they, hey, you got to get me out of here. Don't open these doors out here and let these inmates out, man. You got to get me out of here first. I am in fear for my life. I'll tell on whoever I got to tell on. I got to do whatever I got to do to make sure that my heart keeps beating. Man, please get me up out of here. Scary as hell, right? When they come through for count, I go to my door. You got to stand up for count. Turn your light on. You and your cellmate both got to stand up. Lights on. Feet on the floor. Stand for count. That's what they say. I go to the door and I'm watching the whole time. I'll just do the cell. I'm like, I know he's going to pass a note or he's going to stop that guard when that guard comes by, right? 
doesn't do it. Guards don't even pause. They pause long enough to look in the cell, write the two down on the list, and keep it moving on by. They come by my cell and go on about their business. I tell my son, I said, wow, dude's going to take whatever they're going to give him. Man, if I'm still in dude's back, he's going to go down there and they're going to, I guess, do whatever. It's crazy. Like, I just knew he's so smart. There's no possible way he's going to fight these dudes. He joined that gang to begin with for protection. Like, and now he needs a gang to protect him from his gang. At such and such hundred hours, count is now clear. Such and such hundred hours now, count is now clear. Resume day room activity. You start hearing the cell doors pop. Bang, bang, bang. Dudes are rushing to get over to the phone. Let me get the phone next. They jump on the jack. Dudes get in line. Guys are getting in line for the microwave. Guys are going to the shower. You want to get to these things before other guys do because if not, you're going to have to wait in the back of the line, right? I see the young dude. The young dude is hauling ass. Straight past his homeboy said said he was going to fight him. Whew. Straight up to the control booth. And in front of everybody, everybody's watching to see how this plays out. It gets quiet in these type of moments. We hear him say loud as day, the GDs are going to kill me. They're trying to get me to go in the cell. They're over there at that cell. See all the dudes mobbed up that cell? They want me to come in there. They're going to try to kill me. They're accusing me of stealing. Y'all got to get me out of here right now. Officer opens the front gate. Tells him step out. He steps out. They shut the gate. Now he's safe. He's in this little square we call the vestibule where nobody can get to him. Lock down. Lock down. She gets on the microphone. Comes over the microphone. Everybody lock down. GD dudes know what it is. They go up to the front gate and they telling him, you a bitch. No matter where you go, we're going to get at you. It doesn't matter if you go on the other side of the yard. If you get shipped to the next prison, we're going to get you. You're going to wear what's coming to you, boy. You're going to wear what's coming to you. We all lock back down in our cells. They let him out the second gate into what's called the Sally Port. He goes out with the sergeants. They come in, a bunch of carts. Not just that one cart to lock him up. They go to his cell, pack all his stuff up. Now we've got upwards of probably 10 officers and about four or five carts in our pod. Anybody that had parts of what was going on with this dude fearing for his life, they've now gone and locked up. I'm watching them take dudes out in handcuffs, one after another. One after another, one after another. And then they would come back after they took their property and them out and locked them up in the hole, and they would lock up more. We stayed on lock the rest of the evening. As they came in that pod, they cleared out every single GD gang member and our pod. All because this guy wanted to be a thief and couldn't wear the ass whooping that was coming to him. Did he deserve to die? No, I'm not going to say he deserved to die. But there was definitely a lesson that needed to be learned because the next group of guys might not have just beat him half to death. The next man might have killed him. So these, these, these times, these moments, these lessons, they're necessary. A, because they're not going to allow you to steal from them because then everybody else thinks they can. And B, because it might be what saves your ass in the long run. You got everybody locked up, check man. I've seen a lot of these guys. A lot of these guys came back on the yard, came back in the population. But this guy did what's called a refusal to go back to the yard. When they come to you after your 30 days of being in the hole, and they say, all right, your whole time is up, go back out to the yard. He said, mm -mm. y'all gonna have to ship me. Are you disobeying a direct order? Are you refusing to go out in the yard? Yup, I fear for my life. So he didn't come out on the yard. They'll go to you again after 30 days. You've been in there 90 now. Hey, it's been 90 days, man. You're looking like uh, you, you're losing weight in here, man. I'm telling you, you're starting to look like you're on your deathbed. You sure you don't want to go back out in the yard? No, nope, not going out there. Y'all going to have to ship me. And in due time, they shipped him up off there. They ended up shipping a couple of those gang members for the threats and, you know, security risk. And they go through their personal property and find out, damn, he's high ranking. We didn't even have this dude on our radar. But we'd have found some kites in his cell now letting us know, yo, he's running this. And they jam that man up all over the sneaky-ass little dude, the scary-ass little dude stealing. Let me tell you something. If you ain't ready for what comes with whatever it is you do in life, don't do it. Because had he had not got to that control booth and one of them guys had got out there cell first and grabbed him and snatched him and thrown him over in that cell, oh, we didn't want to unlock. 
Some guys would have went to the hole. There's a very good chance he'd have went to a different hole. The type of hole they take, the lower caskets down in. I learned a valuable lesson with that Troy situation. Don't let nobody owe me no money. Bring the money with you when you come. It's because you think you know somebody don't mean you know somebody. People change, places change. Everything changes, man. Especially when you find yourself incarcerated. Guys that might have been okay on the streets, which Troy was not okay on the streets. Troy had that dope fiend larceny on the streets. But they'll try to make it seem like, hey, I'm locked up now, I'm better. Or guys that were okay on the streets come to prison only to turn out worse. Prison's not a place you want to be. Let's get that very, very clear. Never take this as glorification or something to make you want to go to prison. Don't forget these are the things that happen in prison. These are my experiences. You have your moments where you can laugh, you can joke, but it's never a good day when you're incarcerated or you're away from your family. That young dude eventually got what he had coming to him. No matter where he went, they sent a kite, they reached out, they told him, hey, keep a lookout for this dude. You better believe somebody got on the phone, looked up what prison he was in, and let somebody over there know this is what he did. He might have ducked that ass whooping for that day. With being gang affiliated, you can't get out of it. It's coming. You can't do all your time in the hole. Most importantly, you can't go through life running from your problems. Don't put yourself in situations you can't handle. Don't take things from people you can't afford to pay for. Prison is not a playground. It's nothing like the brochure. Um, I would say at one point it was a man's world. Now prison has become an idiot's world. Where men are just sprinkled in the mix. For the most part, it's young dudes. And that's what you see all day. The older guys have learned to do their time and stay out the way. So you don't see a lot of them. They're not making a lot of noise. But when they do... It's a lot of noise. I hope that nobody watching this that's ever been to prison returns to prison. I hope that nobody watching this that's never been to prison never goes to prison. Live your best life. All those things that you say you want to do, you plan to do, do them. Nothing can stop you but you. We all have setbacks. We all go through things. But at the end of the day, the only thing standing in your way from doing what you want to do is you. So as y'all know, it is Friday, Friday, Friday. That means it is payday, payday, payday. Got to get this money. Got to get the guys paid. I'm tired. I want to go home. I have to work tomorrow. Pretty sure I have to work Sunday and then back at it Monday. But hey, like I said, you want to get through some. You want to get somewhere. You got to go through things. And that's exactly what working does. Work until you get where you want to be in life. Y'all see me? I'm on camera. Outside of the camera, I'm working. My hands stay dirty. So if anybody thinks I just sit in the truck all day making YouTube videos, you're just another one of those people that thinks they know everything. When in reality, you don't know shit. Anyways, these jails, detention centers, these prisons, they're all just crazy worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. Just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life to all my real ones and the also real ones watching. Because y'all still watching me. Y'all know how we do. Salute.